So hello everyone and welcome to SeaShip third uh, free webinar series. I would like first of all to thank you very much for joining us online and for being also with us here at ESHEC Brussels Management School. Today's webinar addresses cultural entrepreneurship, what skills for the future. Before we start, I would like to dedicate a quick moment for housekeeping. For our kind participants online, we have muted everyone by default. For all participants uh, online and here at the um, theater, the auditorium uh, at ISHEC, please note that the webinar will be recorded. If you are attending online, please feel free to keep your camera on or off. The last 20 minutes will be dedicated to Q&As. If you are online, you're welcome to use the chat box throughout. My colleague Karen will be collecting questions and addressing them to the speakers. You can also click the microphone icon to mute or unmute yourself for participants in the room. Please feel free to address your questions directly to the speakers. Okay. Okay, um, I would like to start by giving you an overview of SeaShip and then I will introduce our five bright speakers. So I will be sharing my screen. I hope it will be clear to everyone. And So SeaShip is an action learning entrepreneurial training program which is designed for professionals in the cultural and creative industries. And uh, it was designed by ESHEC in response to the COVID crisis under the framework of the International Year for the Creative Economy and Sustainable Development. This training program is actually uh, designed for uh, CCI's professionals or aspirants who would like to launch an entrepreneurial journey, ensure their financial viability of their projects, and develop or strengthen their management skills for sustainable, thriving, and uh, resilient projects while maximizing their societal contribution and positive impacts. This training program is funded by the Brussels region. We are very happy today to uh, launch the first webinar of the third series, which is actually in partnership with the Large Scale Skills Partnership for uh, Cultural and Creative Industries. And uh, it is also a side event of the European Week of Regions and Cities. So today's webinar will be tackling uh, the topic, Cultural Entrepreneurship, What Skills for the Future? Our first speaker is Elona Lelonek Husting. Thank you very much, Elona, for being today with us. Elona is a policy officer at the Unit for Proximity, Social Economy, and Creative Industry of the Directorate General of, for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship, and SMEs at DG Grow at the European Commission. As policy officer uh, since uh, April 20, uh, 2009 at the European Commission, she has been in charge of various files on the EU tourism policy, on social economy, and on creative industries. During 2004-2009, she was a parliamentary assistant to a member of the European Parliament, and she holds a master's degree in economics and international relations from the Krakow University of Economics in Poland. She also studied management and territorial development at the University Pierre Mendes in France in Grenoble. Our second speaker is Daphne Tipper. Thank you, Daphne, for being with us today. Daphne is a policy director for the media, entertainment, and arts sector of Uni Europa, the European Services Workers Union since 2017. She is responsible for the coordination and implementation of projects and campaigns. Before joining Uni Europa, Daphne worked for the European Commission 
advocated for the arts sector towards EU policy makers, coordinated large-scale international partnerships in the justice sector, and has been running since 2014 Creative Skills Europe, the European platform for employment and training in the audiovisual and live performance sectors. Uh, sectors. Daphne graduated in 2001 in political science and public international law from the Free University of Brussels in Belgium and was a researcher at the UNESCO Chair for Peace, Culture and Human Rights at the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. Our third speaker is Alexandra Lambert. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for joining us today. And Alexandra is the coordinator of the CCI's platform by Hub Brussels Agency. She's uh, in contact with an ecosystem of about 300 stakeholders in the CCI sector in Brussels and works hand by hand with about 75 partners active in the entrepreneurial journey of creative people. Before taking on the job in December 2023, she was the coordinator of the Circular Economy Cluster Circle Made of the Brussels region for almost three years, but her main experience was to be the founder and the manager for 15 years of MAD, Home of Creators, the center and incubator for fashion and design sectors in Brussels. She experienced also the graffiti sector through a temporary occupation of an old supermarket in the Mollier area between 2018 and 2020, and she graduated in Economical Sciences at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in 1994. Our next speaker is Anime Verlinden. Thank you very much, Anime, for joining us. Anime is the Financial and EU Project Officer at Culture Locket, a knowledge center and learning network for cultural entrepreneurship. Culture Locket has a direct link with cultural workers and organizations through a unique help desk and several trainings program. Anime is part time responsible for the finance department of Culture Locket. Recently, the other part-time, she became responsible for connecting Culture Look It to Europe and the EIT Culture and Creativity Program. Last but not least, uh, I would like to welcome uh, our last speaker, Yermina Stanuyev. Yermina is uh, online uh, because she's currently uh, attending the Europa, Europa Nostra Awards in Venice. We all envy you, uh, Yermina. Uh, Yermina is a policy and research expert and lecturer in the field of cultural heritage and international cultural relations. She's an individual expert to the European Commission Expert Group on Cultural Heritage. She holds an extensive experience in policies, evidence-based research, as well as assessment, monitoring, and implementation of numerous international projects, as well as programs working with institutions such as Uppsala University, K11, Una Europa, UNESCO, Europa Nostra, European Commission, Goethe Institute, Brussels, Politecnico di Milano, etc. Uh, her focus uh, is on culture-led policy development for addressing interdisciplinary global challenges through different governance frameworks and geopolitical levels. She's currently also a co-chair of the EIT Culture and Creativity Strategic Topic Group on Cultural Heritage in Green and Digital Transitions for Inclusive Societies. She's the expert advisor to the European Heritage Green Paper and expert of Charter Advisory Board co-author of the report Skills, Training and Knowledge Transfer in the Traditional and Emerging Heritage from the Structured Dialogue with the European Commission, expert assessor for the European, uh, European Urban Initiative, Innovative Actions, New European Bauhaus Projects on Preserving and Transforming Cultural Heritage, vice chair for the Creative Europe Program, European Heritage Awards, Awards jury member. Thank you very much for the five of you for being with us today. And uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to you, Elona, to uh, please present the European Year of Skills and explain the vision behind it and introduce also the background of the Large Skills Partnership for Cultural and Creative Industries 
under the EU Pact for, skill, for Skills. Uh, you will also present uh, initiatives of DG Grow to support entrepreneurship and skills in creative industries, in particular, Worth Partnership Project and Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs. Welcome, Eliona. Uh, thank you very much, Ruba, for a very nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon to all. Um, I would like to thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you to you, Ruba, and to the ISHEC Brussels Management Schools, first of all, for, for organizing this webinar, but also for your very um, um, active involvement in s entrepreneurial skills and uh, uh, also because you are leading the working group on entrepreneurial skills of the Large Scale Skills Partnership. Um, for the cultural creative industries under the Pact for Skills. So thank you for that. Uh, so I'm very glad to be here and to have this opportunity to present you uh, several actions of European Commission, DG Grow in particular, um, on supporting entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship in cultural creative industries and also give you a bit of overview what we are doing also for uh, to support um, CCI's professionals uh, to improve uh, skills. But first of all, uh, let me mention uh, some very general uh, information, very general background. Um, so when we speak about cultural and creative industries ecosystem, uh, I wanted to stress that actually this concept of the industrial ecosystems have, have been um, uh, proposed by the European Commission under the EU industrial strategy in 2021. And uh, uh, actually the cultural and creative industries was uh, identified as one of the 13 uh, ecosystems of the whole EU economy, uh, which are key actually for building resilience, uh, but also for the green and digital transition. And what is very important is that actually this cultural and creative industries ecosystem have, has been recognized among uh, such different uh, industries like textile, automotive, um, uh, energy intensive industries. So this was really the big recognition also on the industrial, uh, industrial uh, landscape of these cultural and creative uh, sectors. And of course, what is very important for today's um, uh, webinar is to mention just the key figures that w when we speak about cultural creative industries, actually we are speaking about uh, more than 8 million people employed in Europe. And uh, what is really very important as well, that almost uh, majority, 99%, are really small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, but also all this ecosystem is dominated by uh, micro-businesses and freelancers, so we, we know all uh, what challenges this brings as well. And. Uh, uh, when we speak about the cultural creative ecosystem, of course, we speak about many different uh, sectors which uh, are included there, and about the, really the diversity of this of this ecosystem. Uh, so, under um, under the sectors that this ecosystem covers, there are of course audiovisual activities, uh, video games, cinema, but also music, books, uh, press publishing, advertising, cult cultural heritage, um, live performance, visual arts, also cultural education, and a lot of creative entrepreneurs are driving the creative economy, for example, in music, uh, publishing and media, architecture and design. Uh, what is also very important to highlight is that Europe is a global leader in cultural creative industries, uh, in particular in content creation, and it's also home to global industry leaders in media, publishing, music, uh, and fashion, for example. Just very brief, uh, maybe a very brief overview that, of course, as the sectors are diverse in this um, cultural creative industry ecosystem, we have also a lot of EU policies, strategies that have impact on these cultural creative industries. And, of course, we have some very specific uh, strategies or, for example, EU work plan for culture, which is really dedicated for, to, to the cultural sector, uh, but also, apart this, uh, for example, 
what uh, is impacting the cultural creative industries is, as I mentioned already, uh, our EU industrial strategy, SME strategy, EU skills agenda. Uh, we have also EU a key in the, in the intellectual property rights, uh, le EU legislation, for example, on design protection. And of course, big policies such as EU Green Deals with the New European Bauhaus or uh, Europe's uh, digital decade and all um, development in digital world. For example, the last, uh, last June, the uh, Commission uh, published also the communication on virtual worlds. Uh, there is also Artificial Intelligence Act uh, uh, currently in, um, in uh, legislative, uh, le legislative process. So there is a lot of uh, policies, strategies that have impact on cultural creative industries. And of course, uh, our colleagues from Connect are working on the media and, and uh, audiovisual action plan. And I just wanted to mention that as many policies we have for cultural creative industries, as many funds we have as well. Uh, so the EU is mobilizing a lot of uh, funding opportunities for, for the cultural creative uh, industries. Uh, of course, there are a lot of funds that can be used for the investment in these uh, sectors, uh, starting from Creative Europe program, but also Digital Europe program, cohesion policy funds, which uh, marked uh, more than 5 billion uh, euros for, the, for this uh, financial perspective. We have Horizon Europe, through which um, there is the, we have uh, co-founded Knowledge and Innovation Community for CCI, so EIT, Culture and Creativity. But also, to support SMEs, we have Investment EU SME Window and a Single Market Program, about which I will uh, speak a bit later. And to uh, facilitate navigating around these different funds, uh, there is the Culture EU Funding Guide, which is available online in order to, to help stakeholders to navigate through these different programs. So let me now uh, come to the concrete initiatives that we in GROW uh, we do for, to support entrepreneurship in cultural creative industries. Uh, so our mission is uh, to foster and support entrepreneurship, networking skills for competitive and sustainable growth and innovation in cultural creative industries and also to promote their spillovers for the EU economy. Uh, we have several, actually, flagship initiatives, among which WORF Partnership Project, large-scale skills partnership for, for cultural creative uh, industries ecosystem under the EU Pact for Skills. I will speak about this too a bit later. Uh, but what I wanted to mention is the action that we have in DigiGrow, Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs, which is a very concrete uh, program to support young entrepreneurs who want to go abroad to the host uh, entrepreneur and to get this on-the-job training. Uh, this person can go for, uh, for the period of uh, between one month and six months and actually uh, accompany these host entrepreneurs in their uh, daily operation. And this program is horizontal, so it's for all sectors, but we see that it has been used by uh, many also uh, professionals from cultural creative industries. So we also want to promote it through the, uh, among the cultural creative industries uh, community. Uh, till now we have we, uh, more than 10,000 exchanges was, were, were already supported under this concrete initiative. And this call for applicants is open uh, all the time. So uh, there is really good opportunity to get this on uh, the job training. What we have as a feedback is, of course, that these young entrepreneurs, uh, what do they acquire? It's, of course, these um, uh, entrepreneurial skills. So this very, very practical training, how other uh, entrepreneurs in, uh, in other countries are operating as well. And also this collaboration result uh, very often in a long-term uh, cooperation. Uh, what we also support in DigiGrow is Enterprise Europe Network, which is a very huge European network of, um, of uh, um, a Chamber of Commerce uh, members of this network located in all member states of the European Union. 
which provide actually very practical support to SMEs. So uh, this uh, network is very, very active and they support SMEs in different ways. For example, if um, an enterprise needs uh, advice, legal advice, or um, advice on access to markets, access to funds, uh, but also uh, this program is meant to, to help enterprises, those who have international ambitions, actually, to help them to find partners in other member states abroad um, to do this matchmaking and to help them to grow. So this is also very, very practical tool that actually we, we uh, finance. And uh, what is really important is that uh, we have a specific uh, sector group there for cultural creative industries. So uh, we work also closely with them. They have different working groups uh, and support enterprises on access to finance, green and digital transition, for example. Another tool is, for example, cluster collaboration platform as well, and uh, intellectual property SMEs uh, help this. Uh, what I wanted also to present to you today is the, our flagship project, WARF Partnership Project, uh, financed under COSME and Single Market Program. Uh, actually, through this program, it's also our program how we support um, uh, cultural creative industries and in particular designers uh, in uh, acquiring more entrepreneurial skills. Uh, this incubator program uh, uh, put together designers, creative people, artists for example, together with um, SMEs, manufacturers or technology providers. Uh, we build their partnership and the objective is uh, to that they work on an idea, they develop uh, innovative, uh, innovative products, services, or business ideas. And um, this program, uh, of course, the, its objective is to strengthen the competitiveness and innovation if, of SMEs. It's um, addressed to the lifestyle industries, uh, so um, uh, the designer can work uh, with uh, to to produce these different products or services in lifestyle industries, meaning textile, fashion, home decoration, furniture, accessories, uh, and so on. Uh, this program uh, also is very, very successful. We really we provide a mentoring program through which we really accompany these uh, partnerships you know, in this way to innovate on these products and also to put them on the market. So they also go through kind of mentoring program when they receive training and to really uh, help uh, also on different aspects like, for example, uh, IPR protection or how to access markets, marketing and, and so on. And what is really important is that the call for this partnership is currently open. So it's also opportunity now to advertise this program to designers in particular and those uh, who want to have this, uh, also this entrepreneurial um, uh, career as, uh, as, as designers, uh, so they can also, um, we invite them also to take this opportunity and to apply. What is really important is also that through this program we encourage uh, co cooperation, so uh, we support partnership. It should be a partnership um, of at least two uh, partners from different member states, but also we provide uh, support uh, if someone doesn't have a partner, we can uh, we can provide support uh, in order to look for, for, for the partners. So we have a specific platform for that. So this is something very specific and uh, for, for um, boosting entrepreneurial uh, skills as well. And now I wanted also to mention, uh, of course, the European Year of Skills that uh, we have currently. Um, it was announced by uh, our president, Ursula von der Leyen, in, the, um, in her um, uh, State of the Union speech last year. And uh, we have launched, the Commission have, have launched this uh, European Year of, of Skills in May this year, and it's running till May next year. Uh, the objective is, of course, to um, promote the mindset of reskilling and upskilling, 
but also boosting competitiveness of companies, uh, realizing uh, the digital green transition, uh, and how we do it. Uh, we, we want, of course, to increase investment in skills, uh, to make sure that the skills um, have uh, appropriate relevance by also close cooperation, uh, that we also uh, match, um, the objective is also to match aspiration and skill set with labor market opportunities and to attract uh, people from the third countries with the skills needed by the union. Because of course, different research uh, shows that we are lacking in Europe, for example, IT specialists. So this is also, uh, through this analysis, we want also to fill the gaps in, on the market. Um, so this is very quickly just to, to, to show you that, of course, the European Year of Skills is the, is the initiative of the European Commission, but the Commission is not doing it alone. We do it together with member states, with stakeholders, so everyone actually is, is uh, invited to join and, um, and get involved because, of course, we wanted to raise awareness of different uh, upskilling opportunities. Um, so stakeholders have also this opportunity to use the communication materials uh, that are uh, at disposal and also to organize, uh, organize uh, events. And this brings me to the last part of my presentation, uh, but really very, very important, uh, about the EU Pact for Skills and also what we do under the Pact for Skills, in particular for cultural creative industries. So the EU Pact for Skills was an initiative launched even before the European Year of Skills um, in 2020, and it is one of the action under the European Skills Agenda uh, and encored in the European Pillar of Social Rights. Uh, basically, we can say that it is a shared engagement model for skills development in Europe. So it promotes joint action to man maximize the impact of investing in improving existing skills or training in new skills. And so the idea was to mobilize the stakeholders also to make visible their commitments, how they, uh, what do they do also in order to upskill uh, the, the workforce. And uh, under the Pact for Skills, we have, um, we have uh, either individual commitments from organizations that are active in upskilling uh, people, but also uh, what we were uh, advocating for was to federate uh, stakeholders under the industrial uh, ecosystems to work together in order to really improve skills in the uh, ecosystem, ecosystem in including cultural creative industries, to make sure that you know we we know what the needs of these ecosystems are uh, for upskilling, and we also help them to take uh, appropriate actions. So this is why also the Commission, DG Grow, but together under the lead of DG Employment and also with collaboration of colleagues working um, in other DGs uh, relevant for different ecosystem. We mobilized stakeholders actually to, uh, to work together and to set up this uh, large-scale skills partnership under each of the industrial ecosystem. Uh, this, as I said, was really very important because we wanted actually to make sure that, you know, after the COVID pandemic, um, that these ecosystems also recover in a way that you know n no one is left behind that all uh, stakeholders uh, can benefit from from uh, from the trainings and also uh, what is really important is through these uh, trainings to contribute uh, to embracing green and digital transition because this is something that everyone actually needs to uh, needs to um, upskill um, uh, for, for that so um, it is very important to underline here that actually we are also very lucky to have committed stakeholders in cultural creative industries that get on board and um, uh, set up this large scale skills partnership, which is stakeholders driven. And under uh, the leadership of uh, Creative Skills Europe, which is represented here by Daphne Tepper, and uh, BEDA, the Bureau of European Design Association, and also 
creative, European Creative Business Network. This um, big partnership was set up in April last year. Uh, today we have more than 100 committed organizations and we really want to have it like um, federating all uh, stakeholders from cultural creative industries which are committed to upskilling to work together because we believe also that this joint action will be um, beneficial for, for all and also we can structure better the support needed. And the last thing I wanted to stress is that this partnership work on uh, very important priority needs for the cultural creative industries, uh, digital, green, but also business entrepreneurial skills, um, the skills for cross-sectoral innovation, for example, uh, arts and crafts, and also creativity. So I will not be too long on that because Daphne will continue with, with this. But uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you for your attention and I stay at your disposal for the question after. Thank you very much, Ruba, for having me and for inviting the Large Scale Skills Partnership. Thank you everyone for being here. And thank you, Ilona, for the introduction. I will pick up from um, what Ilona presented um, just to give you a bit more details about the the history of the Large Scale Skills Partnership in our ecosystem and, and where we are at now. Um, so, as was mentioned by um, Ilona, um, the CCI, as we call it, the Cultural and Creative Industries Ecosystem, present a great diversity um, of subsectors, as it was mentioned by, by Ilona. So, we bring together people who work in different subsectors who have very different occupations. Um, as was said by Ilona, we bring together um, a sector that is composed of a large majority of very small enterprise, um, enterprise and freelancers. There are some big uh, employers, of course. We can think of you know, the big uh, cultural institutions or the big broadcasters, and, but, but at the end of the day, when you look at the, the entire employment population, a vast majority is a uh, is very small organization of freelancers and we are a sector as was mentioned that as others is facing a lot of uh, challenges and transformation um, related to the covid crisis digitalization green transformation um etc cetera, etc cetera. so um what we decided to do with this partnership is really to take into account those specificities of our ecosystem and think what would be most useful to do in order to um, to really be um, as helpful as possible to uh, as many people as possible as, as many businesses and organizations as possible, and uh, and the whole idea was really that we promote skills and training as an investment in the sector, in its businesses and economic growth, but also in its crafts and its talents. And, uh, but also to secure individual careers and to support the well-being of the professionals in the sector. So that really we took all the dimensions of the, of the question into account. Um, so as Ilona said, what we did is when, we, well, when um, the European Commission um, reached out to the sector stakeholders to set up this partnership, uh, there were some consultation meetings, lots of stakeholders were invited, especially the stakeholders that have been working on the topic of skills for many years. And, uh, and where we were invited to start thinking on a manifesto that would be kind of the basis of the partnership. So a manifesto that then further organization could uh, endorse and support. And by these endorsements, they would be joining the part partnership and joining forces with, with other stakeholders in the sector. So the key two elements of this manifesto, I invite you to go and read it, is that um, we want to promote through this manifesto a lifelong learning ecosystem for the cultural and creative industries that is relevant, <coughs> which is accessible to all, affordable for all sector professionals, including the self-employed, and this is a great challenge. Um, and as Ilona said, um, what we thought what would be very useful as a first step is that to reinforce synergies between all those different subsectors that create um, our um, economic uh, industrial ecosystem, but also pooling resources 
um, between the very small organizations and the very fragmented landscape of projects and initiatives that existed already across Europe on the topic of um, upskilling and reskilling in our sector. Uh, so as was mentioned, in my last count, I was 118, but it's moving all the time because actually the partnership is an open, uh, it's an open uh, initiative. So organizations are joining, not every day, but quite uh, at, a, at a quite regular pace. The only uh, um, condition to join the platform is to be part of the ecosystem, cultural and creative industries, and to be active and or interested to be more active in the field of um, <laughs> reskilling, upskilling, supporting professional training. So we are really, really open. Um, so as uh, as was mentioned, we had all, we have over more than a hundred uh, members that endorsed this manifesto and that are member of the Large Scale Skills Partnership. All the organization member of our partnership also have to endorse the Pact for Skills, the overall overarching um, EU Pact for Skills. I think it's important to to note. So that's another condition. Um, and just to give you an idea, there is a great diversity in those members. They are from the different subsectors of the CCIs. Um, they represent uh, European social partners, so employers organization, workers organization in the sector, but also professional associations and guilds that represent those freelancers, for example, that work in the sector. We have um, European networks of uh, art schools. We have national organizations that pro promote uh, entrepreneurial uh, creativity across the board. We have individual um, training institute, individual schools or university. We have projects, um, European projects. So we have a great diversity of uh, types of members to the partnership. As was mentioned, the partnership was launched formally in April uh, last year. Uh, we had um, already two plenary meetings, online plenary, plenary meetings of the partnership in October last year and June this year. Um, the partnership is steered by um, those three organizations that were mentioned already. Um, the Bureau of European Design Association, Creative Skills Europe that I represent, which is an initiative of uh, employers' organization and trade unions in the field of um, audiovisual activities and live performance activities, and ECBM, which is a network of um, intermediaries which promote um, the cultural and creative industries across Europe. Um, so when we started, we had to decide how we would function, and I think it's important to know that for the moment we function on a voluntary basis, so it's all the organization and the projects that put um, their own resources uh, in the activity, so it's, I'm not going to lie, it's, it's, a, it's rather slow, but I think given the circumstances we did quite a lot already, and here I really want to thank the support of the, the Commission services, but also the, the members of the, of the partnership that have put their time and commitment in it, including Ruba, <laughs> as, a, as a leader of one of the, the working groups. Um, so we created um, um, a work a governance structures as well as a work plan. Um, so it is driven uh, by the co-leaders and the working group leaders to have further activities and further exchanges, um, we proposed and it was agreed that we set up working groups that are thematics and that are reflecting the priorities that are in our manifesto. And then we, we have, of course, daily management. It's not daily. <laughs> we, I should change that word. We, we don't manage to do daily, but we do as often as we can to just manage the, the activities of the platform. Just for your information, there are six uh, working groups that have been set up, again, so reflecting the priorities of our manifesto. The first one is on intelligence and data gathering because we know that there is a lot of projects, a lot of initiatives that are already out there uh, across Europe to identify the skills needs in our sector, identify the key trends to uh, pilot um, um, education program such as this one on, entrep on entrepreneurial skills. So the idea was to collect as much and reshare as much as we can, but also of course identify the gaps, and there are of course gaps. There is another one on communication out and outreach, so how to 
get our partnership known across Europe, how to bring new members, how to uh, communicate on our activities. There is a working group on skills for the digital environment, on entrepreneurial skills, we mentioned it already, on skills for the green transformation, and on cross-sectoral innovation. So those working groups, they met several times. Everything happened online at the moment. Um, they collect information. Some working groups already drafted some papers uh, that were presented uh, to the plenary meeting um, in June. Um, and one of the key initiatives that was launched, that will be launched this year, is the Creative Skills Week. Uh, that's going to happen the week of the 9th of October. And I think it's important to mention that when our Large Scale Skills Partnership was launched, almost at the same time, the Cyanotypes project was launched. And Cyanotype is um, a pan-European project um, which is um, entitled Alliance for Sectoral Cooperation on Skills, which is funded by the Commission. It's the Blueprint Project. So it's big, um, uh, ambitious projects to um, actually identify the, the footprint of the sector and to identify the needs. So the idea was, of course, to work together. And so actually the Cyanotize project, they are leading the first two working groups. So the one on data and the one on communication because they are already working on that in their project. Um, so they are leading on Cyanotypes, is leading on the Creative Skills Weeks. There is an event happening in Vienna in the context of the Cyanotype project and also in connection with the EIT, creativity and others. And there will be also uh, events happening online during the same week because not everyone can be in Vienna. Um, and so there will be the second webinar of the CC project taking place on the 12th of October and as well just afterwards a webinar organized by a working group on the skills for the green transition. So uh, every all the information is on the link, creativeskillsweek.eu. You'll find link there to presentation of the webinars and also registration link. And I will just maybe finish again to repeat that for the moment, um, the partnership very, very much relies on initiatives that are already exist, organization, projects, um, like, and really C-SHIP is kind of the, the best practice model because you really, it's interesting because in the series of seminar, of webinar of C-SHIP, you actually call out on the different working groups. Um, so there is one today and then there is one on cross-sectoral innovation and one on green. And of course, that's what's interesting is that there are connections, of course, between all the topics and that the whole idea, what's interesting in this initiative is that it brings people together that don't know each other from across different countries. We connect topics that not everyone necessarily have thought about and, and that's already enriching with the resources we have and thanks to the support and commitment of individuals and organizations. So, um, so again, the partnership is open to new members and our next plenary will happen online in November or December. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daphne, for uh, this uh, very rich presentation about uh, the pact, um, the large scale skills partnership for CCIs. Actually, I would like to rebound on what you were saying by uh, stressing the fact that, of course, it's a voluntary uh, work, but it's a very enriching experience. So I highly recommend to join the Pact for Skills also because it's an opportunity to meet brilliant minds and learn from other experiences all over Europe. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And now we move from Europe to Brussels region, and I would like uh, to welcome you, Alexandra, to uh, tell us, please, more um, about what is happening in the Brussels region in terms of um, the platform of cultural and creative industries. So thank you very much, Ruba, for inviting me today, and thank you for this large audience. Um, here in the room and also online. Um, so my name is Alexandra Lambert and I'm the coordinator, uh, the new coordinator because my colleague is here in the room and she's the, 
the first one, coordinator. Uh, so I'm the coordinator of the platform dedicated to the cultural and creative industries within the Brussels Capital Region's Economic Agency of Brussels. And before starting this debate, um, I'd like to give you a brief overview uh, of the platform issues. So the CCI platform was founded uh, in July to, um, 2022 within a Brussels uh, as a measure of the shifting economy, which is the plan to decarbonize uh, the economy adopted by the Brussels government. Um, so we are, uh, as Ruba uh, explained it to you, a Brussels-based network of over 60 partners active in supporting uh, the creative entrepreneurship and our ecosystems totals 300 organization, organizations, sorry. So we began our work by commissioning a study uh, from the VUB uh, to understand the economic impact of CCIs in Brussels. And here are a few figures uh, to speak for, for themselves. So we have 22,000 entrepreneurs active in the CCIs in Brussels. Uh, the CCI sectors account for 101,000 um, employees in Brussels, so this is the second larger employer in the region after public organizations, and it includes uh, 40,000, um, no, sorry, uh, 84,000 salaried employees and 17,000 uh, self-employed workers or 19% of all self-employed workers in Brussels. Um, the CCIs uh, account for 3.9% of Brussels gross domestic product, and the outlook for growth is very promising because gross prospects for 23-26 are stable despite the fact that several sectors have been hard hit by the pandemic. So the median income is very low um, because it's only 2,146 uh, euro per month, even though 83.5% uh, work of workers have a very high level of education. There are a lot of women, 40%, uh, a lot of foreign workers, 30%, and we see it as an opportunity. And the workforce is very young because 80% are aged between 25 and 49 uh, aged old. This is high re highly resilient sectors which are growing faster than most other sectors in Brussels which with a high concentration of jobs in Brussels. So it's a really uh, a good opportunity also to invest uh, uh, for the economic growth. Uh, we are talking about a project economy, uh, which implies a large number of statuses linked to cooperatives or part-time or full-time uh, self-employed workers, as you said already. And as far as the nomenclature of CCI sector is concerned, we refer to the, defici the definition of sectors used by UNESCO and its 10 or 11 sector, if we include the, knife li the nightlife sector. So it's from video games uh, to dance, from design to advertising and marketing and so on and so on. And for the platform, we have six sorry, focuses between now and 2024. So first, we would like to develop a, sorry, a truly uh, cross-disciplinary network and synergies between our partners. We would like to create a mapping uh, of institutions active in supporting creative ent entrepreneurship. Sorry, I think I'm, I'm lost in my... In my uh, presentation. Uh, sorry. Um, so we would like also to ensure a good governance of the platform um, we would like to 
bring the needs of CCIs to the attention of the government and draw up a deployment plan for the creative economy. And we, will, we would like to work on, uh, and we work already on the transition of our members, in particular through examples of good practices. And we will, we'll do, we actually do a benchmark of CCI ecosystem internationally to see how the other uh, countries uh, develop their ecosystem and they promote it. So we will be finally holding a major annual event at the National Theatre on 21 uh, of November as part of the Shifting Economy Week of the region to demonstrate the exemplary nature of the CCIs in terms of transition. So, but, um, so, sorry. <laughs> uh, ah, yes, I forgot to, to say that we have a cap for 2030 because uh, we try that Brussels becomes the European cultural capital uh, first. Uh, it's the bicentenary of Belgium and it's also the end of the process of the shifting economy uh, plan of the government and so uh, it's also an objective that we develop many measures uh, through this, this uh, date. And what about um, really the future in terms of skills uh, in the CCIs? It's, uh, very large topic and not really easy to speak about it because I have the impression that I'm the little baby here uh, involved in, in, the, in those sectors. But uh, what I can observe uh, is that as far as skills needs in the CCI are concerned, for me, it's impossible to review all the possible, all the possible new professions given the range of sectors covered by the creative industry, and we have uh, supported sectors and economic sector bring together in the same uh, uh, height. So it's not really easy to, to see what happened everywhere in all the subsectors. Nevertheless, what I can observe first of all is that the current, uh, the current uh, uncertain context accompanied by more visible feminist values are bringing much more to the fore soft skills aimed at promoting ethical and balanced businesses that respond to the needs of, of the heart that create authenticity, give many meaning to commitment and embrace joy. This call for new and more open ways of operating with greater cognitive diversity uh, including empathy and creativity, is crying out to be heard. This approach, which is as novel as the context itself, will, will certainly enable design thinking to deploy its innovative user-centered methods for thinking about business models. In the digital world, we are also seeing the development of new professions. There is a lot of buzz about the web because it's a sector that recruiting and every year new training courses and schools are set up to provide training in these buoyant occupations so that you can get a better grasp of the market. Sorry, I go too fast. There are almost uh, 80 different careers in the web including AI uh, developer, podcast manager, cybersecurity expert, data analyst, UX UI designer, and digital learning manager. I'm also seeing the emergence of international events uh, like um, links to digital content producers, such as the Numix Festival, which is due to take place in Brussels in December. This type of festival, which comes from Quebec, a pioneer in showcasing the creative industries, celebrates excellence in digital creativity. So VR, XR, AR, skills ups are springing up all over the place to connect this medium with the life sciences, the entertainment sectors, cultural tourism, and so on and so on. Um, virtual reality allows you 
to be completely immersed in a new world after conquering the world of video games virtual reality is now starting to make inroads into the world of training unlike traditional training virtual reality make it possible to establish a link between theory and practice scenarios and immersion provide a realistic simulation of working conditions saving precious training time extending Reality or XR defines everything that alters reality, whether near or far. All technologies that modify the sense of vision are represented by extended reality. And this term is often used in the professional world for industries, for video game platforms, or by all adword manufacturers. Um, so this is really new sectors not really new, but uh, they bring new new process of, of, of um, training, new process, new schools, new new jobs, and uh, we have to really observe uh, really uh, near from them what happens in those fields. As far as advertising and marketing uh, are concerned, it is also certain that artificial intelligence will revolutionize certain professions, such as dubbing. Dubbing will be done perfectly um, with artificial intelligence for soap, but in animation, on the other hand, voices will remain the, per the preferred choice for premium productions. So they will, this will amplify the dualization between machines and humans, and we have also to observe what happens and what professions disappear and what appears to the new market. And nowadays, more and more dubbing actors are seeing clauses appear in their contracts as asking them to sell their voice for synthesis. So there is a lot of change also in those uh, sectors about uh, publicity, marketing, advertising. New professions will also emerge, su such as knowing how to give the right in instructions to artificial intelligences. Part of the advertising industry has also been transformed by the emergence of influencer, and it's a, also a new job which appears on the market. So we need to connect standard stand-up jobs, influencers, and new technologies. Photographers haven't disappeared, but there are fewer of them. You still need to have a good eye when you are photographers and be able to get the framing right, but the tools available, cameras, free, free applications, are increasingly sophisticated, even on smartphones. For creative pro professions, uh, only the very best will remain, those who stand out from the crowd or who have a high level of excellence. There is also a shortage of technicians in the performing arts, for instance, and there is a huge need uh, to retrain them to install, for instance, LEDs in concert hall or uh, performing arts uh, places. It's a question of transition. Speaking of sustainability, in the audiovisual and um, film sectors, for instance, we are seeing the emergence of startups such as the Green Shot, uh, which are going to revolutionize the way we think about productions from advertising to the biggest shoots. This young startup uh, has created an ERP, a kind of Odoo, which collects financial data on filming and media productions from all the teams, and via a tech application installed on a <coughs> smartphone, the IRP immediate, immediately carries out an individual carbon analysis, analysis of the activity of each employee, giving, giving tips on how to change practices and improve in its impact. It's truly revolutionary and brilliant. And they've just opened the Green Shot USA, uh, which uh, will which with a local partner will enable them to penetrate the entire Hollywood audiovisual production sector. In the fashion sector, we have also a startup from Brussels, Resort Tex, which is uh, revolutionizing textile recycling practices, 
always considered as the second most polluting industry. Through PhD research, they have developed a sewing thread that dissolves very naturally in an oven, also designed by their teams. This provides an incredible solution to closing dismantling, which is the main obstacle to textile recycling because of the labor cost involved. Through all these examples, I believe that the digital revolution uh, and the need for transition, as well as greater emphasis on soft skills, will lead to new knowledge and new professions, and that will give an essential place to the creative industries in the world that is changing now. Connecting the creative industry with the traditional economy, it, it's, a, it's, a sh it, it's still a challenge that must become a matter of course as a tool for adding value to our economies. The future skills will connect sustainable and social transition, digitalization, and mo more soft power particularly in leadership. And I'm proud, really proud, to be involved in raising the profile of these industries as instrument of innovation and as new employment prospects, whether for highly qualified people or those without qualification. Thank you for at your attention. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for um, explaining the vision of the Brussels uh, CCI's platform in embracing the triple transition of the digital, green, and uh, social innovation, and uh, how the skills is the skills issue is is uh, addressed by uh, the platform. This brings us to your presentation, uh, Anami which has to deal uh, more of entrepreneurial training and what's the perspective of Culture Locket, which is specialized in entrepreneurial training, but also you as a partner of EIT, Culture and Creativity. So uh, we're looking forward to your insights. Thank you so much, uh, Ruba, for your introduction and the invitation here today to join this webinar. Good afternoon, everybody here at ISHEC and those online. Um, I will be speaking for Culture Rocket, is an organization that has joined the EIT Culture and Creativity. Um, and Culture Rocket, uh, I will explain a little bit who we are because I think it's important to see the connection with the EIT Culture and Creativity. And it will also env envision already a bit of uh, skills and how we look at uh, these. So at Culture Rocket, we believe that entrepreneurship is actually already present amongst cultural workers and uh, organizations. We see this in the way they work together um, and the qualitative, creative and cultural scene that Belgium already uh, has. Cultural workers are often highly skilled and they show strong uh, professional expertise. But, uh, and maybe I will repeat some of the things that were already said, being the fourth speaker, uh, but we see uh, some kind of missing middle. We see a large group of self-employed, freelancers, small organizations versus a small group of large companies. We see that many cultural workers find it, difficulty, uh, find it difficult to earn a good income, and we see the same with small organizations who uh, find it difficult to find uh, funding. Um, and then there are, of course, the other challenges, such as the recovery after uh, a difficult uh, COVID period, um, thinking of digitization, uh, for example, AI in arts, but also uh, the extensive range of applications that can be used in an organization uh, for data management, for example. And of course, the green transition, which might lead to new investments for organizations or a new way of working. So the type of entrepreneurship that seems to be um, uh, remaining underexposed is for us the the entrepreneurship at the organizational level. Um, and to tackle this, uh, we might not only need new training programs, but we might also need to spark uh, a new mindset. Um, for example, uh, not-for-profit um, is not the same as not making a profit at all. Or estimating value higher than money might not be the same as not getting yourself being paid. 
um, being aware of legal clauses in a contract doesn't make you a lawyer, but all these things, having a little bit of knowledge, do help you uh, with your self-confidence when you have your first negotiation uh, with a commissioner, for example, as an artist. So, um, finally, uh, we do need skills, and skills is what we are talking about today. Skills will help us to get started, uh, to make happen what we want to accomplish. Um, so at Culture Loquette, we focus on self-sustainability and an entrepreneurial mindset. We offer an extensive website where our clients can find uh, information. Uh, they can, um, but they can also they find they will find practical answers, but they will also find information, for example, about copyrights, which is uh, is really good uh, um, in a large way explained. Um, we have a second thing that we have is a kind of uh, unique help desk uh, for uh, organizations and culture workers. They can contact they can contact us every day by appointment, and uh, we work together for this with a team of uh, freelancers, 15 freelancers in various with various expertises that help them with their questions on entrepreneurship. Um, as you can see on the slide, we, last year we had more than 4,500 questions that were asked us and uh, all these people were, were helped with that. Uh, and then we have something that we might call um, our secret sauce maybe, the sincere commitment of our, uh, of our colleagues to, um, to inspire and motivate our clients, the culture workers, our efforts to speak the language of culture workers and organizations. Um, we offer a lot of inspiration on our socials and we are particularly proud of two podcast uh, series we had uh, called Kulturzaken, which I highly recommend to those of you who speak Dutch, where culture workers or cultural entrepreneurs speak for themselves about their experiences as being an, a cultural entrepreneur. Um, now, knowledge might be the beginning of wisdom, but it's not enough to organize one's own organization and that's why we also offer training courses. Uh, these trainings, training courses, they range from a, a simple webinar where we uh, give information. Um, it could be one-on-one um, -on -one coaching, it could be multi-day uh, uh, courses. Our trainings um, are based on, on uh, well, aim self-sustainability and an entrepreneurial mindset. And so we look, uh, we focus on skills and um, that are transdisciplinary. So we uh, put the several disciplines together in one room and we, we really look at skills that go beyond the, the silos of the subsectors. We encourage networking and peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, we try to help them understand the innovation process within themselves, within their organization, within the world that surrounds us by systemic and design thinking. Uh, we want to be inclusive for our professional, all professional culture workers and organizations. Um, our, uh, for example, we are we offer physical trainings as well as digital trainings, and we try to be sustainable by design. So we do a lot digital, but when we are physical, we are close to the rail to the, the rail station, etc. Um, now. Um, in order to understand uh, entrepreneurship in culture, we also look abroad. And Kulturlocket has been a part of European networks for several years. Uh, Kulturlocket is a mobility information point, being a partner of On The Move. And we are a member of the former ECBN, which is now EFCE, or the Creative FET. Uh, we will also be joining the Creative Skills Week in Vienna. We are also a part of the Pact for Skills, so we try to connect with uh, the values of Europe and what we can, the entrepreneurship uh, in Europe. Um, through this network, Kulturlocket uh, has been involved in the startup of the EIT Culture and Creativity. So maybe I will explain a little bit what it is about. EIT is an innovation community, a European institution of technology, and its aim is to increase the competitiveness of Europe by innovating through connectivity, integration, and cooperation. Now, this means that uh, EIT brings together education, innovation, and business. And this is what they call the, uh, the knowledge triangle. And an innovation community is not only uh, a project, it's actually a company which is set up to be sustainable in itself and drive the innovation uh, 
innovation ecosystem of a specific challenge. And the first EIT started out in 2010, it was the EIT for climate. And the past years, eight other communities were founded as the EIT uh, for digital, climate, uh, digitization, future of food, and so on. And ultimately, in the beginning of this year, the EIT for culture and creativity. So uh, what will they do? They will start, uh, for example, new master program, PhD programs. Uh, they will deliver mission-driven innovations uh, that are related to the market, that is important. Uh, tools to support organizations to be more resilient. And they even aim to train over 2,000 businesses in the next uh, years to come. Uh, at the same time, all these new innovations will also drive the green transition. Now, um, EIT Culture and Innovation has uh, indicated 10 action programs on education, on innovation, on business creation, uh, social, on um, um, society being social change, and also systems, which is about data uh, creation and evaluation. Now, EIT has defined uh, five challenges, which are not on the slide, it would lead us too far, but one of them is, um, one, one challenge that was defined is the low entrepreneurial tech and cross-cutting skills limits innovation, growth and competitiveness. So, um, well, what kind of skills could uh, contribute to this? And that is what we also do at uh, Kulturloket. It could be, for example, about uh, business skills, as in financial management, uh, making a budget, making a financial plan, understanding how funding mechanisms work, um, being as simple as uh, learning to work together with an accountant. Um, it could be uh, skills uh, on the digital, uh, the digitalization, which we already talked about. Um, it could be about strategic planning, uh, data management, but also, uh, as you already mentioned, uh, soft skills, uh, learning uh, how to value your own work, being a kind of uh, self-respect, uh, being able to negotiate, building your self-confidence, uh, leadership, taking things in, in your own hands, uh, presenting your work to organizations of different types of stakeholders, uh, critical thinking, working together, co-creation, uh, what kind of skills do we need over there? Uh, and even within the EIT, go-to-market skills, uh, when innovative products have been uh, designed. Um, and of course, the methodology is also important, uh, design thinking, systemic thinking, um, creative thinking. So, of course, um, there is a lot, lot, lot more to do. <laughs> to it, uh, to tell about the EIT culture and creativity. It's not only about skills. And I would, uh, I would like to invite everyone here uh, to come to the European Culture and Creativity Days in Amsterdam with the opening of the co-location center or the, where uh, you will have, we'll have more explanation about yeah, what EIT does. And uh, it's on 16th and 7th October in Amsterdam. So uh, a warm welcome over there. And I think uh, I would like to thank you all for listening to my short. Thank you very much, Anemi, for uh, your great presentation and for connecting uh, your work here in Flanders with the work at the European scale. Actually, this is very important in uh, creating synergies and uh, learning uh, from each other. I would like now to continue on European projects and uh, move to our last speaker, last but not least, Tirmina. You have the difficult task of uh, entertaining us before the questions and answers and finally the drink. Uh, and I would like you to elaborate a little bit about your entrepreneurial viewpoint in the European Heritage uh, Hub and what kind of training you uh, are envisioning to provide uh, the participants with. Thank you, Ruba. Um, I hope you hear me all well. Yep. Is it okay? We, we Great. Hear you well. um, and for slides, can I do somehow from here or I need to ask you to move them further? Uh, no, I, 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 
I'll can do not. It. I'll do it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so first of all, um, apologies for not being there in person, uh, but the reason is exactly European Heritage Hub. Um, European Heritage Hub project actually is holding its first forum uh, in Venice, uh, which is within the European Heritage Summit happening um, this week um, in Venice. So um, I have a bit of a difficult task because um, I tried to boil down the topic uh, from perspective of one specific project. And this specific project is not one of a um, horizon project or one a project that can be compared to any other. Uh, specifically because this project comes from um, so-called pilot projects and preparatory actions, uh, which means that actually it builds up on something that already existed. Um, and in this case, it is um, the European Year um, of um, Cultural Heritage in 2018. And it actually um, also aims to establish something for even longer perspective um, uh, in a specific um, topic. And in this case, that's cultural heritage. Um, I'm focusing on cultural heritage as one um, subfield of, of culture and creative industries, um, and will actually try to explain you um, uh, what European Culture Heritage uh, Hub um, is actually doing in that regard. Please, next slide. Um, so this is just to um, understand um, the, the consortia of the European Heritage Hub that is led by uh, Europa Nostra and main uh, four partners in, um, in addition to Europa Nostra, so Eurocities, Europeana, Kyle Leuven and ICLEI, Local Government of Governments for Sustainability, and then a number of associated and affiliated partners. Um, the, the consortium is quite large also because the, um, uh, the, the hub itself has a large um, scope and geographical scope, but I'm going to move um, to the next slide to explain you actually um, the background and how the European Heritage Hub um, and why has been established. Um, so the hub has been established to actually respond um, to the need of a permanent heritage um, actions. As I mentioned in 2018, um, you, you probably know there was a European Year of Cultural Heritage and the European Heritage Hub actually um, has a um, difficult task of maintaining the, the aim and, uh, the, the, and maintaining different actions uh, that were initiated um, uh, of, 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 of during the European Year of Culture Heritage. And actually, the specific topic of um, culture heritage skills and professions has been initiated also um, in, in this period. First, when was the, um, in, in 2016, the first um, structural dialogue with the European Commission uh, on the topic of culture heritage, um, traditional and new or emerging skills and professions. And after that, there was a process with uh, the OMC, the Open Method of Coordination, uh, where the, the, the talk on the, and the report um, came out after the two years of work with the member states experts on the topic of the skills um, and professions in the field of culture heritage. And afterwards, that also led to a number of other projects such as FLIP, uh, FLIP 1, 2 and 3 and, and uh, Project Charter, which is um, a part of, 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 of in the same line as, as Cyanotypes, which is um, um, an alliance for culture heritage skills and professions. So the role of um, culture heritage, European Culture Heritage Hub is actually to bring all these stakeholders together um, and to uh, act as, a, as a, 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 an umbrella, so to say, uh, among different initiatives. Um, so it also sub, uh, aims to establish a de and develop an autonomous advocacy and knowledge platform, bringing together a large a number of cultural heritage stakeholders um, and in particular when it says cultural heritage stakeholders that also means cultural heritage entrepreneurs um, and you just also need to understand the, um, the scale the extremely large scale um, of this action so um, for each of these action cultural heritage entrepreneurs which are very specific um, group or a subgroup of entrepreneurs are also included and the task of the European Culture um, Heritage uh, Hub is more to create actually conditions uh, for entrepreneurial skills to develop than to work directly uh, with entrepreneurs. So please, the, the next um, slide. Uh, so one of the main challenges um, that uh, the hub is actually addressing 
is to place um, the cultural heritage within the green um, social and digital transformation, so the triple transformation. And from the perspective of um, skills and, and professions, uh, one of the questions or provocative questions that I like to ask cultural heritage professionals is we are trying to talk about the Green Deal, uh, about the new European Bauhaus and all the uh, green uh, movements that we are currently having in our policy documents. Uh, but um, the culture, the, the Green Deal, um, even with all the work that has been done to prove that culture heritage um, sector actually uh, belongs there, um, the culture heritage has not been spelled out even in the Green Deal and, and lacks to be um, clearly uh, spelled out in the new European Bauhaus. So the question from the, from the perspective of skills and professions is uh, for culture heritage professionalists, um, what and how uh, they have missed actually from the perspective of abilities and skills um, to advocate for uh, to have this uh, positioning clearly um, stated out. Uh, please, Europa, next slide. Um, so, in that regard, one of the main objectives um, is to really, um, I'm not going to read through all these uh, five coming, uh, but to put um, the culture heritage at the, at the heart of the, of the triple um, transformation. Please, the next slide. Um, and in, in particular, uh, to promote uh, the participatory governance in the cultural heritage e ecosystems and uh, engage with diverse stakeholders and citizens and their active participation. And this actually also includes um, very much the, the entrepreneurial capacity of stakeholders who are um, entrepreneurs in the field of cultural heritage or more importantly, potential entrepreneurs in the field of culture heritage. And why this, um, why I'm putting this in a specific um, uh, light, simply because culture heritage um, entrepreneurs are pretty different from the from other entrepreneurs having in uh, the specificity of the culture heritage field, the public sector, the policy making, um, also the, the need for the for very specific business models development when, when it comes to in particular uh, tangible culture heritage, the buildings uh, shift uh, in the governance models of, of buildings from from participation to, to commons, etc. Next slide. Um, so, in that regard, um, I would just like to um, again underline uh, the triple transformation, which is the focus of the of the hub. So, the green, the digital, um, and social, and looking actually into different perspectives of how this is possible, how it's possible to place culture heritage uh, within the. Um, um, within the all three. Um, however, what the hub is actually mainly looking for is not to look into cultural heritage, placing it within the green or digital or social, but how actually these three overlap. Um, and in particular, that has been very challenging. Um, and as the hub actually started only a few months ago, one of the first things that has been developed is, is a white paper, um, a position paper on how these three overlaps and also including the, the entrepreneurial skills and how they can um, tackle some of these um, challenges. So the next slide. Um, in understanding uh, the complexity of the scope, um, I just need to give you an explanation on the geographical scope. Um, so the hub is active uh, in all EU member states um, and has actually recently also got a mandate from the European Commission to work on the six Western Balkan uh, countries, uh, Ukraine and Moldova, and three countries in Caucasus. So you can understand that the geographical scope is really um, large and um, therefore even more challenging, um, simply because we are facing um, a large uh, diversity of realities toward not only cultural heritage um, realities, but also entrepreneurial realities or policy realities in, in the field of culture heritage and triple um, transformation. And please, next slide. And um, how do we do this? Um, so entrepreneurship is a transversal component. Um, these are the five, let's say, main um, elements of that, that the European Heritage Hub is implementing. Um, that is uh, knowledge sharing, networking, training and capacity building, the policy lab and program uh, development lab. And um, I would like to focus mainly on training and capacity uh, building and the policy lab. 
uh, both of them are actually developing a number of uh, peer-to-peer learnings, identification of local good practices, educational study visits within the universities, but also within the local governments and the local stakeholders, including a number of um, entrepreneurs and all uh, different stakeholders involved in the triple transformation. And on the other side, um, also developing um, uh, a European Heritage Policies Monitor, where we will be able to look into policies from different perspectives, not only purely culture heritage policies, but all policies related to triple transformation, including also how member states are supporting uh, development of entrepreneurial capacities in the field of um, culture, and in particular, culture heritage and triple um, transformation. So the next slide, please, and the last one. So, as I said, and I wanted to underline, um, I didn't go very deep uh, into, into all aspects, as you can understand that the, the hub is very comprehensive and, and huge, but um, European culture heritage hubs actually uh, rather develops capacities to work with and enable entrepreneurial skills to develop the uh, rather the, the environment um, that can encourage um, entrepreneurial um, mindsets to engage with the triple um, transformation through a set of skills and creating conditions for, for developing these. So um, that's all from my side and I'm happy to um, answer any questions that might come. Thank you, Ruba. I hope I was on time. Yes, thank you very much, Yermina, for this wonderful presentation. <laughs> You're, you're adding into the complexities discussed today because you're dealing not only with a variety of sectors, but also of a diversity of entrepreneurial ecosystems in different countries, but also in different uh, policy areas and policy uh, legislative, let's say, machines. Um, if you all agree, since we are here in the room and we will be sharing a drink in a while, maybe we can privilege the questions online uh, because later we can discuss here informally. So if you have questions online, uh, please open your mic and uh, raise your questions. There are plenty of opportunities for people from the cultural and creative industries uh, to upskill and reskill, and there's a complexity of available fundings and grants uh, everywhere. Um, is there a way to simplify for people to easily understand, especially since we're speaking about uh, an ecosystem which is made of variety of the majority of freelancers? Is there a way to address directly? Uh, individual entrepreneurs with user-friendly tools or how to understand where they can uh, access uh, information. Uh, yes, thank you, Ruba, for this question. Yes, there are a lot of EU funds which are available, hmm? what I was mentioned, and we try to uh, facilitate the navigating among different funds, what I already uh, said that we have this guide, but also it can be uh, difficult for SMEs to actually find this information, get in this information. That's why uh, from DigiGrow, for example, we are supporting this EN Enterprise Europe Network, so SMEs can actually contact them locally and they can help them in this uh, navigating also to access to finding not only EU funds, but also, you know, um, having access to, uh, for example, loans or, you know, access to entrepreneurs, uh, to fund funds for entrepreneurs for, for private investments. So this is also uh, very important and I think uh, they provide really uh, tailored made um, uh, advice for SMEs. And why I wanted also mention the Pact for Skills, why we present it as a very important initiative and why we want to federate all stakeholders working on upskillings, upskilling together, because under this initiative, we also provide uh, support services for the large scale skills partnership, but also all signatories uh, of the Pact. And under um, these support services, we have something like uh, different kind of hubs, guidance hub, uh, knowledge hub, 
and also um, a funding hub. And there uh, we work with the contractor who also gather all the information about uh, funds available, uh, about different calls for proposal that are open, about the funds which are really de devoted for uh, investing in skills. And this is also something very practical that it, it is, of course, online, but also uh, through these uh, support services, uh, we organize meetings, uh, actually to inform uh, as many stakeholders as we can about these different opportunities. Thank you very much, Elona. 